welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade, and today I'm joined by Lieutenant Colonel Tim Scheffler. Chef, welcome back to the show. Hey, Colin. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Well, you didn't screw it up last time, so we're going to give you another <laughs> shot, right? Yes. <laughs> no, I actually really enjoyed the interview that we did previously. For those who haven't met you before, haven't listened to your previous episode, that was a discussion around being a civil engineer, right? Right. Uh, you and I served together. We were deployed together to al Yadid. That's where I really learned what it means to be engineer from you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a good time. Yeah. But when we did that interview, I was remiss that we didn't even talk at all about you being a squadron commander. Yeah. Which, when we did the interview, you were a squadron commander at the time, right? I was sitting in the squadron command at uh, Joint Base lewis McCord for the 627th Civil Engineer Squadron. Yep. Yeah. So that was then. A few months have passed since then, and you are still a I'm squadron commander, still a but squadron at commander. A, <laughs> a, a different base. Again, you didn't screw up the previous one, and yep. so they're giving you another shot at it. Yeah. So apparently I didn't make enough mistakes, and I was rewarded with another opportunity to make mistakes. <laughs> no, I was given another chance. I was asked if I want another chance, and Frankly, you know, you learn a lot as a squadron commander, and every day is another day in school. And uh, I had the opportunity to come out here to Yokota Air Base and pick up command for the 374th Civil Engineer Squadron Commander, which is how uh, this squadron is significantly different. It's a whole lot bigger. Yeah. It's got its own unique set of challenges and things to work through and work at. And of course, it's an entire different theater, right? So for 627, it was Western United States, you know, I'm CONUS. Here I'm sitting in the PACAF theater and we're looking at a theater that has a lot of regional constraints and challenges. Sure. Yeah. Different theater, different place on the map, different organizational structure uh, within the Air Force, you know, being part of, you know, home station, stateside kind of stuff is very different from being out there in the Pacific Air Forces or rolled up under a combatant command, you know, PACOM there. Absolutely. You know, everything's different. The game is different. Yeah, very much. Well, very good. What do you say we cut on over to the episode that you're here to provide some commentary on about leading airmen from the perspective of being a commander? That's what we're here for, right? Is this series about being a squadron commander and offering some insight from your perspective that Reed and I are unable to provide just because we haven't had that experience yet. Sound good? That sounds great. All right. So we'll cut here to the episode and we'll meet you on the backside for some commentary about leading airmen. Sounds good. So Reed, we spent some time talking about the importance of the mission that the Air Force is involved in and our role as officers in the execution of that mission. And we've been approaching that discussion from the perspective of these are things that the Air Force values as outlined not only in General Goldfein's memo that we've mentioned previously, but also in AFI 1-1 and 1-2. So we're following those guidelines in this discussion, moving from mission first, as we covered last week, to the leading airmen and the people always piece of that for this week. Yeah, straight from the guidance in Air Force Instruction 1-2, paragraph 3.2. At all times, Officers must lead by example and pay judicious attention to the welfare and morale of their subordinates. This is the second half of you know, that mission first people always, and it's critical we get it right. So that we can get it right, I think it's important that we begin with defining some terms, especially this all important topic that we talk about so much, this idea of leadership. So let's get some basic definitions first. Reed, how do you personally, doesn't have to be any, any sort of 
super official definition straight out of Webster's or any sort of dictionary. How do you define leadership? Leadership to me is both a perspective. It is also a legal position. I have a responsibility, depending on what position I'm in, to perform leadership functions, to inspire, to guide, and direct not only airmen, but the mission to making sure that we're getting done what we have to. I'm also ultimately responsible for the things that have been delegated to me as an authority to accomplish. Good. Now, can we simplify that down just a little bit and focus the definition of leadership to your relationship specifically with your airmen? Such a great question, Colin, because this is such a complicated mess of a situation, right? Being a leader. Um, it's one of those things that we all know when we see it, but it may be a challenge to define. But when I think of leading airmen, I think of being an example and I think of always being on parade. To quote uh, General Patton, an officer is always on parade. What do I mean by that? Everything that you are, everything that you do contributes to this idea of the culture and the way that an Air Force officer should be, and put that in air quotes. And when that is done well, I think airmen will want to follow you. So that's what I think about when I think of you know leading airmen. I don't know that there's a specific right answer to this, but I think that it is important that we look at leadership in these two very separate contexts. They go together, they are hand in hand. In many ways, they are inseparable the leadership of the mission and the leadership of the people. But for the purposes of today's discussion, we need to focus in on the leadership of the people specifically. And I think, was it you that said back in a previous episode that leadership is a gift from your people? It is. Yeah, that's definitely the way I've always viewed it is, yes, I may be in a position of legal authority giving me power, literal power from the Constitution to direct and manage the mission and the people that are involved in it. But the leadership that I want to be given is a gift from the people that choose to follow me, that I have earned that. And in some of the models of leadership, you know, perhaps we'll talk about another time, that's a specific type of power. It's called referent power, where people respect you for who you are and what you represent and how they feel being around you when they choose to give you their followership. You know, that's straight out of power and authority lesson from both ROTC and OTS. So, but that made an impression on me because I think about that when I think of the great leaders I've had and some of the less than stellar leaders I've worked with. There are people I would get in line to take a bullet for and others that I don't want to follow to the all call they've just said I had to go to. So I think that's something I think about. I think if I were going to go through the same exercise, if I were to define leadership in just a brief sentence, I would say that leadership is the act of getting people to do something or influencing them to do something that they would not or could not do on their own. And so there is still some of that mission aspect in there in that these people are going to do something. But in absence of your leadership, they would not or they could not accomplish whatever the mission is. You as an officer, you as the leader of these airmen are the linchpin. You are the catalyst for the proper and full execution and accomplishment of the mission. That's one way that I like to think about it. And where I'm going with this, Reed, is that there is no one way to define leadership. It is such a massive topic that people have been discussing and theorizing and contemplating and studying for millennia. And we're not going to solve it here in this single podcast episode. But it's good to get an idea of what some possible definitions of leadership might be. And I also think it would be valuable to explore here just for a little bit what the history of leadership is as far as it relates to the Air Force and 
us as officers in the Air Force. Yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, I remember teaching a lesson at OTS and one of the things I would do is, you know, on this exact idea of how big a topic this is and how, you know, even if I kept my students awake for 24 hours a day for the entire eight weeks, I'd nowhere even near scratching the surface on this. You know, just go to Amazon or something, you know, another service where you can purchase books and just search leadership. There are millions of books written on this topic. So, all right, I'm going to quickly run us through the last 200 years worth of leadership theory as it helps us to understand how we've gotten to where we as Air Force officers and the Air Force as a whole view leadership and this idea of leading airmen. So back in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s, this is really when Western leadership philosophy and leadership theory started to come about. And at the time, the idea of leadership was centered around people who were, quote, born leaders, people who were just born with the innate ability to successfully lead people to do things. They were able to have an impact on society at large. And we're talking about names that we are all familiar with, people like Napoleon or Sun Tzu or Abraham, these names that stick out to us from the annals of history. And the idea is that these people, these usually men, and that's why this is called the great man theory. No offense to our sisters at arms here. At the time, they focused their theory around these men that were able to achieve greatness and have a large impact and shape society through their actions, through their leadership. So that continued through the 18th century into the early 1900s and led to an eventual overall theory of what it is that the different traits or characteristics that these types of men, these types of leaders are able to exhibit. And if other people who weren't necessarily born leaders were able to exhibit those same characteristics or those same traits, that they would be successful leaders in their own right even if it wasn't something that was natural to them or that they were born with. And this, the idea that there is a cause and effect sort of relationship between those traits and then the results that you would get out of people. This sort of theory led you know, business thought the decade between 1930 and 1940, but eventually gave way to uh, became known as situational leadership. This took over in the 1970s where the focus shifted away from the traits that were found in a specific leader. And then the focus shifted away from the traits of the specific leader and to the abilities and behaviors in the followers. So still some of that cause and effect relationship was there, but the idea came forward that leadership is based on context, based on the follower, as opposed to the person who is the leader themselves. Meaning the way that you would lead someone who works on an assembly line and the types of behaviors that you need to be exhibited there is going to be a different type of leadership from what you would see, say, in a, an operating room. Very different situations, different types of behaviors, different types of skills that needed to be exhibited there. And so a different type of leadership would exist in those different situations. Also during this time, a renewed emphasis was placed on the relationships between the leader and the follower. That it wasn't just about the leader exhibiting specific characteristics, but they needed to get the buy-in and develop some sort of way of motivating their followers. So that continued for a number of decades, this idea of situational leadership, and eventually was replaced by what is now known as the full range leadership model, or FRLM which is what the Air Force now has adopted as its primary way of describing leadership. The full range leadership model it takes us through a series or a spectrum of different types of leadership that move through laissez-faire type leadership, through transactional leadership, on through transformational leadership. And as you move through those different types of leadership, 
the leader becomes more actively involved in their relationship with the follower and the leadership style also becomes more effective. The FRLM was adopted by the Air Force in the 2010s and has been the primary way of explaining leadership and theorizing about it in the Air Force for the last decade. The full range leadership model emphasizes the fact that leadership is dynamic, just like in the situational leadership from before, the type of leadership that you use, it will be based on the situation, will be based on the context, will be based on the followership, the mission. All of these different variables have to be taken into account. And you as the leader must decide which type of leadership style to use based on those different variables in order to achieve mission accomplishment and the highest level of effectiveness that is available to you. Awesome rundown, Colin. Thanks for that review. You know, something that kind of came to mind as you were running through this history of the study of leadership, the first, you know, half of this history that you reviewed, it was very much focused on self. You know, what can I do to be a better leader? And not really considering very much the people that you need to lead and the way they viewed the situations. And I thought that was very interesting. And I find that you know, even with the students I had, a lot of them still had a lot of these ideas that leaders are born. It's something they are or aren't. And, you know, officer training school was the first time a lot of them had given any serious study to the idea of developing as a leader. And what are your thoughts on why that's the case? This idea that the great man or the trait theory has persisted so much in our society? I think a lot of it has to do with the way media portrays our heroes, our celebrities, the people who are the quote unquote leaders. Just take a look at the Marvel universe, for example. Captain America, you know, Steve Rogers is a man among men. You know, he is just naturally gifted. Never mind the fact that, you know, he's been injected by, you know, radioactive material and has been turned into some superhuman type of person, but the personality was there to begin with. And then you know, the scientists gave him the superhuman strength, but he was just born to be a leader. Same thing with Tony Stark, Iron Man, that he was just born a genius, that there was nothing he had to do in order to develop the skills of being a leader. It was always there. So I think that media has played a large role in shaping the way that we consider or that we think about who leaders are or can be. Yeah, I think that's fair. And it kind of aligns with, you know, my thoughts, the way I've always thought about why this is, why do we still seem to be focused on this idea that's been pretty well outdated and proven antiquated a while ago. And it kind of centers around similar things, but a lot of, you know, marketing and the economy, how it drives us to products, you know, that espouse leadership. You know, I take a quick look at my bookshelf right now, and I've got a number of books up there that I've read that I've liked about leadership. And they very much focus on individual people, studying individual people. The Mission, The Men and Me, Lessons from a Former Delta Force Commander by Pete Blaber, American Generalship, The Art of Command, Edgar Perrier, Band of Brothers, The War Memoirs of Major Dick Winters, War as I Knew It by George Patton, Call Sign Chaos by Jim Mattis, The Generals by Tom Ricks, Duty, The Memoirs of a Secretary of War by Robert Gates. All of these, you know, books that have meant something to me in my journey of trying to become a better leader have found, purchased, read, are very much centered on these ideas that stem from the great man or trait theory. Yeah, I like your list of books. I've got some of my own, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. Some of these I've read, some of these I've listened to, some of them I've spent large amounts of time with. Some have been just cursory looks, you know, kind of just glancing through the information, but still there's some great leadership lessons to be learned from each of these books. Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin, The Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey, Lincoln on Leadership by Don Phillips, The Autobiography of General Schwarzkopf, It Doesn't Take a Hero by Peter Petri. My American Journey, another biography, this time on Colin Powell by Joseph Perisco. Good to Great by Joseph Collins. 
The Mark of a Giant by Ted Stewart, In Praise of Deadlock by Lee Rawls, Nuts by Kevin and Jackie Freiberg, and the list could just go on and on and on. But as you mentioned before, Reed, if you do a search on Amazon or on Google just for leadership books, there's no end in sight. There's no way that you could possibly read everything. And even if you did, there's no possible way that you could understand all of that information and fully internalize it and turn it into something. What I want to say here is that leadership of people, leadership of airmen, it can be seen as a science, but the Air Force, and I think you and I would both agree that it's more of an art than it is a science. I mean, there are some sciencey things about it. There are theories and you know, experiments that can be run in order to gain data and in better insight into how leadership, relationships, psychology works. But at the end of the day, leadership of airmen, leadership it really in any context really is an art form and it requires some creativity in order to get your people, your airmen to do the thing that you need them to do that they wouldn't do on their own. Yeah, absolutely. What this ultimately means is that you need to develop a habit of educating yourself, of reading and practicing and trying different things, not just from leadership itself, but from a wide variety of disciplines to expand your horizons and better understand how the world interacts, how you fit in the world, how your people think, how they fit in the world, recognizing that human relationships are messy at best. They are full of all sorts of known and unknown variables. And we are indeterminate equations. We are unsolvable. We are unable to completely lock down exactly how every single interaction is going to play out. And so leadership is not a science. It is an art form that you have to develop for yourself and go through this process of trying out various different things over and over and over again in all these different contexts with different people and seeing what works. Couldn't agree more. It absolutely is. We talked about bullets and bullet writing and it only gets better with the doing. It's the same with leadership and it absolutely takes time and you need to be on that journey. This is not something that you can just decide, oh, today I have become a leader and I have met the mark or I've studied enough and now I know. The scientist and me and the engineer and you, you know, we think about this in mathematical terms and you just can't put it into a nice tidy equation that makes everything happy and good. So it's got to be something that you put the work into. Every situation, every person is going to be different and you need to develop as many tools as you can to be ready when those times arrive. So Colin, I know I kind of hinted at it, but when and how does this journey begin and how can people know when they've arrived at the destination? The journey begins now, right now. You have to accept that in the situation that you are in at this moment, you are some type of leader. You are exerting some type of influence on the people around you. And you need to become fully aware of that and become purposeful about those interactions. Something that will help you with that is exactly what we've described just previously, is starting to study leadership. Studying it through books, studying it through examples of other people around you, going into a leadership training program such as Air Force ROTC, Officer Training School, the Air Force Academy, or some other professional leadership development program. That type of thing will help you to flesh out your own personal definition and philosophy on leadership and give you the you know, structured practice and application of leadership principles. Exactly. This is something you got to do and you need to start now. Another part of this idea of how do I become a leader? How do I improve as a leader? A really, really important part of this is assessing self. You need to look at yourself very critically. Where am I? What kind of person am I? How did I react in that situation? Was that appropriate? What is my motivation? What gets me excited? What am I good at? What am I not good at? Those types of very critical, introspective questions need to be a regular part 
of your leadership development. Some tools that I've used to help me with these, uh, there is so much to do. Life is very noisy. So I will find situations, times, places to find silence. Maybe perhaps instead, and I'm, I wouldn't advocate this too strongly, instead of listening to a podcast on your way to work in the whoa, morning. Whoa, 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 whoa. I know. <laughs> hey, hang on with me here. Hang with me here. Maybe for a few minutes a day, or maybe just once a week or so, don't have the radio on. Just drive in your car in silence for 10 minutes and see where your mind goes and see if you can see if that can have an impact on your life. Perhaps prayer or meditation or a walk in the woods or some other opportunity to find silence. And I've found that to be very helpful as I try to assess self. Where am I? Who am I? Am I the right kind of person, right kind of leader that I want to be? Another thing that can help is journaling or in some other way, making a record of the daily activities or the week or the month or however you want to do that. But think deeply, sit in silence, give your mind the opportunity to look inwards and see where you are. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the drive in silence. That's actually something that I enjoy quite regularly. Now, I'm a massive consumer of podcasts and audiobooks and those kinds of things as I do my daily drive into work and back home. But at least once a week, for sure, I will just turn it off and I will complete my 45 minute to 60 minute drive home in silence. Because just as you are saying, I need that time to reflect on me. I need to ponder deeply on who I think I am against who I really am or who I want to be. And it's really only in those moments of silence that I'm able to gather my thoughts clearly and arrive at answers, arrive at conclusions. Yes, podcasts like this one and many, many others will provide you excellent information and actionable items for you to work on. The books will provide you great information, great insights, great stories to help you work on that self-assessment. But ultimately, you do have to go through the difficult and somewhat uncomfortable work of sitting with your own thoughts, working through them and arriving at a conclusion. If you're just going through this process of letting others tell you what you're good at and what you're not good at, what your strengths and what your weaknesses are, then you're missing something. You are not involved in the process. You are letting other people dictate to you who you are or what you can be. You need to be much more self-critical on that. Be personally involved in your own development. Real quick, I want to make a plug. Absolutely agree, but I do think we also shouldn't completely discount or discredit what others assess of us. I think sometimes that criticism can be the most blunt and reveal us to a large degree. So that feedback is always good. So I want to make sure that we put that plug in. Oh yeah. Obviously we're not going to be a leader in a vacuum. Yeah, right. Exactly. That doesn't work because you have to have a relationship with other people. There have to be other people involved in this process. Otherwise there's no leadership. There's no followership taking place. Yep. So yes, absolutely. We need the feedback from other people. Excellent. Well, Colin, I think it might be a good idea to go through a couple examples from our careers to kind of show, you know, times that this has been done well and times this hasn't to kind of show folks, you know, this is a journey and it's time to get on the path and start walking down the journey of trying to be a better leader. Who wants to go first? I nominate you. Got it. Okay. Well, I'll just get the ugly right out of the gate first. So I've got an example of a time where I used the wrong leadership tool and it had disastrous consequences. This is one of those really not proud of this moment in my career. It'll be a little disjointed. I can't give too many details trying to protect the innocent here. But the bottom line is I had an airman who was struggling with some aspect of their airmanship. And it was something that I did not struggle with. And the tool I chose to employ was from the full range leadership model, I remember having this conversation with myself like, oh, this is easy. I know exactly what tool to use in this situation. It's called the idealized influence. Colin, could you give our listeners just a quick idea of what 
idealized influence is when we talk about the full range leadership model? Yeah. Idealized influence comes from the transformational spectrum of leadership. The idea here is that you are setting the perfect example to your followers of the type of behavior that you want to see in them. You are the shining light. You are the beacon on the hill that they need to follow and emulate. And if they do that, they can do no wrong. A good example of idealized influence is somebody like Gandhi from Indian history. So Gandhi was constantly setting the positive example. He was a perfect role model. He was the perfect example of civil disobedience. He practiced what he preached. He never struck back. He set the example for the people of India on what they needed to do in order to achieve their independence from the United Kingdom. Awesome. Thanks. Great rundown. So this was my tool of choice. And I decided to become the perfect example of airmanship in this specific category. And I thought, surely this airman will see my amazing example and fall in line and all will be well. It didn't work out that way. Instead, this airman continued to fall short of the expectations and the standards required of an airman and ended up leading to one of my best troops and one of the best troops in our entire COCOM in this person's career field being asked to leave the Air Force. Sorry, what's a COCOM? A combatant command, a geographic combatant command. So we were in PACOM at the time. He had won an award in his career field for the entire combatant command. So he was the number one airman in our entire geographic combatant command. PACOM's, I don't know, about half the planet. It's kind of a big deal. And it was shortly after winning this award, well-deserved, one of the best we had, he was asked to leave the Air Force. And that's not a fun thing to go through. You know, when one of your people is asked to leave because of failure to meet standards and you have to, you know, process them out. I mean, you're talking about, you know, do you have a plan to pay the bills? Do you have a home? You know, all those types of things, you know, as you kick them out. And I finally got up enough gumption to ask, you know, what I could have done better. And it turns out that my intent, which was to demonstrate excellence, turned into a demotivating factor. My thoughts were, oh, if I just show them how it can be done, maybe that will motivate them to get their poop in a group and figure this out. And instead, the attitude this airman took was, I could never do that. I could never be that good. So they stopped trying. So completely opposite reaction to what I was intending. And I think, you know, aside from, you know, a really difficult situation for everybody involved, for me, personal failure. But the thing that it really taught me is I can't choose my leadership tool based on what I think is best. I need to think about it from the perspective of the people I'm trying to influence, people I'm trying to lead. I need to put it in the context of them versus the context of me. Oh, this is something I'm good at. I will do this. It's like, oh, hang on. What is it that they need? You know, that was a big learning lesson for me. I need to look externally first as I try to pick which leadership tool I need to employ in a certain situation. Yeah, I really like this example as sad as the end result was that we lost one of the Air Force's best and brightest. But what it is an example of is that even what we tout as the most effective types of leadership, those transformational leadership side of the FRLM, is not always the right answer. It is a spectrum. There are times where transactional leadership or even laissez-faire leadership in some circumstances is the right answer for that airman or for that specific mission. And I love how you put it there, Reed, is that it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about the officer. It is about the type of leadership that is needed by that airman, by that unit, by that mission. And it is your responsibility as an officer in the Air Force to be able to adapt to that, to recognize what is needed in that situation and provide it so that you can be that influence for those people to get them to do the thing that they would not do otherwise on their own. Thank you for sharing that example. You ready for one of mine? Yes. Can it be a pick me up, please? Sure. I will do my best. Sounds good. I need a good news story right now. So there I was 
Where were you? <laughs> I was inverted. Not really. <laughs> That's a Navy reference for... Yeah. Top Gun reference for all of our, well, you know, very young listeners. Are you excited for the new Top Gun movie to come out? Shamelessly. Yes. Okay. I'm excited for that to come out next year and you know, spend some time dissecting it. Yep. Shamelessly excited. Go fast. Kill stuff. Win. Go Air Force. Even though it's a Navy movie, it's a great recruiting tool for the Air Force. But go Air Power. All right. So I was a lieutenant and I had just been made a flight commander and I was coming into a flight that did not have a superintendent. So real quick, a superintendent of a flight is typically a senior NCO, an enlisted member who has been promoted to E7 or above, master sergeant or above. And my flight did not have one as I was coming into it, except that simultaneously with me being assigned to this position, the master sergeant promotion list came out. And there was a tech sergeant in this flight who had, for lack of a better way of explaining it, burned every bridge that existed within that flight. They were coming up on their 20 years. They were getting ready to retire. I think that they had already dropped paperwork in order to retire. I think that's the case, if I remember correctly. But they had been in long enough. They had been a tech sergeant long enough, and they had scored, I guess, well enough on their test for master sergeant that, lo and behold, they got selected for promotion to master sergeant. Well, what that ended up meaning was that this individual became my flight superintendent. This person who had burned every bridge, who had forsaken every relationship within this flight that they had been a part of for a number of years, because they didn't care anymore because they were planning on leaving, they were planning on retiring, was now going to be in charge. I mean, they could have retired, but that would have meant being retired as a tech sergeant instead of as a master sergeant. And so they chose to take the promotion, which meant that by default, they became flight superintendent. And so I had to deal with their baggage as I came into this new position. And let me tell you, it was tough. It was hard. It required that I spend much of my time contemplating on my own and conversing with them directly on what it was that they needed in order to be successful. What it ultimately came down to is that this individual did not feel safe. For whatever reason, this person did not feel safe, did not feel like they could trust themselves, they could not trust the people around them, could not trust family or friends or anybody, except in very few circumstances that very few specific people that were not located in that flight or in on that base. And so what we had to do was come up with a plan, a way of building safety for this person. And that was not necessarily me being an idealized influence for them, you know, setting the example for them. So I, I would like to think that I did, you know, being an example of how to, you know, trust yourself and the people around you. It wasn't so much that I was being an inspirational motivator which is another one of those transformational leadership types or an intellectual stimulator. But really what I was doing was exhibiting individual consideration for this person. I was seeing them for who they are, for their specific needs, the things that they hope to accomplish as a superintendent, as a master sergeant, as an airman, you know, in the Air Force for a number of years until they were ready to retire. Now, unfortunately, Reed, I am unable to tell you whether or not this story ends well, because just a few months later, I got deployed. And by the time I got back, that individual was gone. Because of their promotion to Master Sergeant, they got PCS to a new location, and I've lost contact with them since then. But my hope is that by these conversations, by determining what it was that this Master Sergeant needed, that I was able to set them up for success and get them to a place where they could be right with themselves, where they could start to be right with the airmen around them, and hopefully right for the Air Force. I don't know if they are still around or not. Maybe this person is a senior master sergeant or a chief now, which would be excellent. Or maybe this person came to the realization that they needed to leave the Air Force, and that's okay too. 
But I hope that this example shows another type of leadership, another way of engaging with your airmen, leading the airmen specifically, not necessarily focusing on leading the airmen for the execution of the mission, but focusing on that person as the individual, as the airmen that they are. Yeah, thanks, Colin. I think that's a great story, you know, especially because it was so focused on the airmen, right? Not on the leader. And it highlights that key difference, right? Between what I was doing incorrectly, totally focused on the leader versus focusing on the airmen. And, you know, I think it might be a good time to wrap this up. This is a tough, tough thing. This is not a destination. It is absolutely a journey. Learning to lead is going to require time. It's going to require effort. It's going to require serious reflection about who you are and what you're doing. It requires you to invest time in getting to know your people, getting to understand who they are, what motivates them, what are their challenges, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, and figuring out the right way to make sure they can get to the destination that they're headed to and start the journey now. This is not something that you can just decide, you know, to turn on or off. It begins the day you decide to join this journey as an airman and at every level. You may not even be in charge of any single person and you are a leader. People will look at you, they will see you, they will hear you interact with others. Every email you write, every greeting of the day you give, all forms that baseline of who you are and how others will interact with you. So get on the path, start the journey today. Yeah, and let's call out the fact that this is not just for people who are outside of the Air Force looking to join it and go through a commissioning program and become an officer. We are talking to people who are already officers in the Air Force. We are talking to company-grade officers, field-grade officers, We are even talking to general officers. They need to continually develop their leadership too. Now, granted, you and I are not at their level. Not, but nope. (laughs) We are not at their level. But even so, a general officer is still on this journey. They still need to continue to develop their leadership abilities because you are never done. You will never get to the point where you can say, I have arrived as a leader. I am now a leader. It doesn't work that way. So whoever you are, wherever you are in this journey, whether you're outside the Air Force, whether you're in it, we hope that this information is useful to you. We hope that it will reignite that fire, that desire within you to improve your leadership skills specific to your ability to lead airmen. Yes, we want you to take care of the mission. The Air Force needs you to execute the mission, mission first. But you also need to be a leader of airmen because that is what the Air Force values. And that is how we are ultimately all going to accomplish the mission together. Anything else you want to say there, Reed? No, I think that's it, man. All right. We'll leave you all there. We hope that you have enjoyed this discussion and that you will also take the opportunity to join with us in the discussion, which you can do in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Air Force Officer Podcast. You can share your thoughts there, define leadership, what it means to you, and also ask your questions. Get us all involved in helping each other become better leaders. If you have any questions, you can send those to Air Force Officer Podcast at gmail.com, or you can engage with us on social media platforms. And we would also be extremely grateful if you would share this episode with other people and or leave us a rating review on your favorite podcasting platform. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. All right, Chef. The audience has had a chance now to listen to the episode, maybe for the first time, maybe since it's a rebroadcast, maybe they've heard it again. But this is a topic that everybody should revisit on multiple occasions, right? So you are the sitting squadron commander here. You are the experience in the room. Let's turn it over to you to give some thoughts on leading airmen, especially from sitting in the squadron commander seat. What is that like to be a leader of airmen? So, you know, one of the things that I really did appreciate with both yours and Reed's discussion is you really emphasize this idea that leadership 
is inherently a communication activity, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And for a communication activity, you need, there's more than one party involved, right? Right. So you have the, the sender and the receiver, and that communication has to be there and you need feedback in that process and any communicator understands and knows that when you're developing a message to be communicated you have to consider your audience in that process right and so just like leadership you have to consider the people that you're leading yeah right it's contextually based it's situationally based and you nailed the head on the end it's relational yeah right there is a, a massive part about leadership that is relationally based so there's this dynamic in the military where we talk about the fact that, you know, there is a separation. You know, we talk about fraternization as being an issue, right? But the reality is, is I can't lead somebody I don't have a relationship with. Right. I can't lead them if I don't understand them. I don't understand what motivates them. I don't understand what gets after them. I don't understand what excites them, what challenges them, what disappoints them. I need to understand the people. Understanding the people that you lead is incredibly important. And that's why leaders in the Air Force are going to be different because the ethos and the what makes up airmen, how we see the world, our worldview is different. Yeah. It's fundamentally different. If you look at a soldier, you look at a sailor, you look at an airman, you look at a Marine, they see the world in different ways. And that's by design, right? Absolutely. It's by design. We, we want them to think, you know, in terms of air power, air mindedness. And that is a very different way of right. thinking and, and of being than, you know, the soldier, the sailor, the Marine. God love them. We appreciate the way that they think and do things, but it's different from us. Absolutely. And we need to understand those perspectives, right? Because the reality is, is at this level and above, I can't look at things simply from an airman's perspective. I need to understand that airman. I need to understand air power. I need to advocate for air power, but I have to understand the joint community. Yeah. I need to understand what my sister service is, what they're trying to accomplish, where their goals are and where they're trying to go. And then and in that way, I mean, that's Goldwater Nichols, right. right? That's the idea of us becoming more of a joint leader. But we have to understand first and be able to see that picture and be able to be able to understand and build those relationships to be able to lead effectively. Yep, for sure. And some of the other things I think that you brought up in that discussion, you know, understanding your people, huge, right? Reed talked a lot about understanding yourself. Socrates put it, an unexamined life is not worth living. Right, yep. Right. Look through, you know, pull yourself open, take some time to reflect, whether that be in a journal, whether it be in just quiet time in meditation and prayer, like take time to understand who you are, what motivates you, who you want to be. Right. I appreciated your comments like, who am I? Who do I want to be? Yeah. Where's the delta? Right. What do I need to change yep. to be able to reach that point? And for me, you talked a lot about books. You talked a lot about reading. You talked a lot about literature. Dr. Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? He starts out that way. You have three internal victories, right? Yeah. You have the three external victories and you have sharpening the saw. So he talked a lot first. You got to address the inside first. Yeah. You got to address the personal victories. You got to achieve those personal victories. And that starts with vision. Who am I? If I died tomorrow, what would I want said at my eulogy? by my wife, by my kids, by my coworkers, by my boss, by my subordinates, what I want them to say. And when you stop and you take a step back and you go, what do I want them to say? Well, I want them to say these things. Okay, is my behavior today going to make them say that tomorrow? And right. that's how they, we then have to shape how we live. So, you know, you hit on a lot of really great things in that discussion, just in terms of leading airmen, knowing your airmen, building those relationships and the rapport with your airmen, and then knowing yourself and learning about yourself and growing. And the reality and the fact of the matter is it doesn't stop. Right. Right. Yep. I mean, there's no point in time where I'm ever going to say, I'm going to look back at myself and I'm going to go, chef, you've arrived. Right. Like exactly. It's, it's a constant growth, right? You just got to constantly rinse and repeat and learn, pick yourself up, make more mistakes, pick yourself up, move forward and just keep going. Yeah. And that's true to 
any type of leadership that you experience, not just specific to the Air Force context, you know, leadership of yourself, leadership within your family or a friend circle or something like that, leadership in the business world, if that's where you find yourself or in academia, or it doesn't matter. Leadership is a process of learning the art. Yeah, there are some scientific things that you can pull on and bring into your leadership philosophy and practice, but it can never stop. Just as you put it, right. it can never stop. Absolutely. You must be a student of leadership forever. Yeah. And you know, some people may find that really daunting, being like, holy crap, I'm never going to get there. You're right. You probably are never going to be as good as you want to be or as good as you can be. But that's okay. You know, you're allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to that's right. practice and try different things in order to further sharpen the saw, as it were, right? Absolutely. But I want to then put that into the, the command perspective as best as I understand it and you know, relying heavily on, on your experience now. Command is very much a finite thing, right? Right. Unlike leadership in general, which never stops, command is you are showing up to this base at this point in time, and you have a very definite exit from command. Right. Now, you may get multiple shots at it, but things are going to be different, just as you explained at the beginning of the episode. And so how do you prepare for that? How do you build a leadership philosophy as a commander? You know, and I wish there was an easy way to answer that question. So I had to stop and I had to really think, you know, like, what is your leadership philosophy, right? First off and foremost, we talked about what leadership is. Let's yeah. let's identify what we think of a leadership philosophy. And and from my perspective, I think it's it's a synopsis, it's a summary of how a leader approaches their role as a leader, right? So if I wanted to encapsulate, if I wanted to tell my people, hey, this is my leadership philosophy, I think it's rooted in their worldview. It is okay greatly shaped by how they see the people around them. It's a collection of firmly held beliefs and principles and values that defines how they lead or how they interact with their subordinates. And so the reason why we want it, that leadership philosophy allows subordinates to anticipate questions and understand commander's intent or the context of the commander's orders while helping that commander or that leader, that commander, communicate their vision, their goals, and obtain buy-in. That leadership philosophy sets a tone within the unit, right? That sets the climate of the unit. And the challenge is, is, and this goes back to evaluating yourself and getting feedback, is that leadership philosophy, what you espouse or what you say or what you communicate to your subordinates, hey, this is my leadership philosophy, might not match what you do, Right. So there's going to be a say do gap potentially, or the video might not match the audio. Yeah. And in those situations, you need that feedback to say, okay, I need to change one of two things. I need to change the way I'm acting, or I need to change my leadership philosophy. And I need to be more transparent with my people. So when I'm approaching that situation, the first thing I did when I walked into a squadron, I sent you the presentation, right? Like, this is who I am. Yeah. I start out, I'm really honest. I'm like, hey, Folks, this is my passion. This is what I have a passion about. Here are the writers, you know, that have greatly shaped my idea or my philosophy about how I see the world. You know, Dr. Covey, Daniel Goldman, Simon Sinek, Jocko Willink, Malcolm Gladwell, right? And a bunch of other authors. And so these people have shaped the way I see the world. They shape the way I see leadership and they shape the way I'm supposed to interact with you. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, I tell them that. And I also say, hey, This is who I am, right? Here's a picture of my family. These are my kids. Here's my hobbies, right? I like video games. I like music. I like helping in poverty-stricken countries, right? I like doing missions trips. I'm an avid believer in Jesus Christ, right? And I think that's important because it reminds folks, it goes back to this idea of the say-do gap, right? Simon Sinek calls it authenticity, Yeah. right? And the idea of authenticity, it reminds folks, hey, I'm human. I'm human just like the rest of you, right? right? Yes, I'm filling the office of the commander, but the reality is is I'm filling the office of the commander. I'm the dude that's sitting in the seat and I'm just here to do the job, but I'm a human just like the rest of you. Yeah. And here's the framework by which I think that framework being my leadership philosophy of of how we're going to interact. And so having that framework established and in place helps 
provide because again it's a two-year period of time and that goes quick man it right. flies by and in that two-year period of time it is my goal as a commander to be able to take this unit and make sure it's moving in the right direction right right from a very dictator like way right and just start making changes left and right but the reality is, is we've all seen that you've seen changes occur within an organization i don't care if you're in the military or if you're out of the military if you walk into an organization and you say do this right and i want it happen and i want it done tomorrow well now you start ended up with either malicious compliance or toxic followership yeah and people will do it and they'll comply but they will comply for that time period right yeah and so if i am supposed to transform a unit within two years i have to get buy-in yeah I have to get people to buy in to why we're going to do something the way we're going to do it. And, and if they don't want to buy into that, and they're not going to buy into it unless I understand where they're coming from, right? I have to get them to own it. I have to get them to pursue it because the people that I'm leading right now will still be here when I'm gone. Yeah. Right. And so that's not easy. Right. And having worked in civilian organizations, you know, very much so. It's some situations you can walk into a civilian organization and you can say, ah, well, it's, this is just the commander for the next two years. So we just got to wait him out. <laughs> and that does happen, by the way. And that absolutely does happen. And it's unfortunate and it's discouraging. But actually, at the same time, you kind of go, well, that's a situation where the buy in didn't happen. Right. Yeah. And it's a great learning lesson because it made sense. It was a good idea. It was a great approach. It was a good solution. But the problem is, is that the organizational culture didn't want to do that change because it was uncomfortable at the time or yeah. there wasn't enough reasoning or understanding of why, right? And it goes back to that Simon Sinek idea of why. So, yeah. And if they do go down the path that you are leading them, but reluctantly, you know, and get that malicious compliance or toxic followership, as you put it, they're doing it not because they are following you, Tim Scheffler, they're doing it because they're following the commander, right? Right. They're following the office, the person who holds that responsibility. Right. Not because they want to follow you. It makes me think about Colin Powell, you know, the way he talks about yeah. leadership being all about trust. It is. And people wanting to follow you, if nothing else, because they're curious. <laughs> they're just interested to see where you're going to lead them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so that is part of the struggle. Right. And so you talked about a little bit about the idea of power. Mm -hmm. Right. And the idea of, yes, I do have the power to just make the decision and say, hey, we're going to go do this and it's going to happen. Right. And there are occasions where that does have to happen. Yes, absolutely. And if, you know, if we're in a disaster response mode, right, or if we're in a, you know, base recovery after attack or something like that. Right. Right. There's situations where I'm going to have to look at, look at my troops, look them in the eye, give them a knife hand and say, hey, go do. Yeah. And, and in those situations, right, I need immediate compliance. I can't explain, hey, well, it's, this is my vision and this is why I think we should go around doing this, right? And in those situations, but in other situations, I probably do have time to say, this is why we need to do it this way, guys, right? And then we can have more of a conversation and look, here's the reality too. I think, you know, we talked about the different dynamics of leading in different services and there's more college degrees in the Air Force than there are in any other service, right? Sure. Most of my senior NCOs are working on something past their bachelor's degree at a bare minimum, right? Some of the folks within my squadron have more degrees than mm -hmm. I have, right? And so we're not talking about uneducated people. We're talking about smart people. We're talking about technically yep. proficient people. My electricians know a lot more. You know, I'm an electrical engineer, but my electricians know a lot. Yep. And they can help me a lot. And they know how to do something versus me just knowing the theory behind stuff. So understanding your people, understanding their talents, understanding their capabilities. There are situations where it makes complete sense to say, hey, let's talk about this. Let's come up with the best solution possible. Let's discuss it. And let me help you understand my why as to why I want to go down this road or do things this way. And if you can do that, that goes back to, you know, that yeah. moving forward at the speed of trust, right? We can establish trust within the organization 
that I'm not going to go off and nobody's following me simply to go, what's he going to do next? Right. Like, you know, they can, they can understand why they build that authenticity. And over time, when I do have those situations where I say, Hey guys, I can't explain why, but I really need you to go do this right now. Yeah. Then there's a, Hey, we've understood. We've built that trust previously. I can go out now. I don't have a problem. You got a boss. We're out there. Yeah. You know, and then after the fact, always do the follow-up, right? Make sure you, you double back with the guy. Hey, sure. Appreciate it team. Thank you so much for moving out on this. Sorry. I had to just basically throw this in your lap, but here's why. Let me give you the background. And then that again, reaffirms that trust with your team. Yeah. And you've heard me talk about the importance of trust before, you know, it has become foundational and central to really the message, the theme of this podcast. Trust comes from the, the combination of character, competence, and connection. If you're missing one of those things, you don't have trust, right? You have something that can move people in a direction that you can lead without all three of them, without trust being there in place, but it's not going to be nearly as effective as it could be, right? The relationship is not going to be as effective as it could be. And isn't that not what we're talking about here? Isn't that not what leadership really is? A relationship between people? You're absolutely right. It is absolutely that relationship between people. You know, one of the biggest quotes that I really like comes from Ender's Game, right? Not the movie, the actual book, Orson Scott Card. And it's a great leadership book. The movie is okay. The movie's but okay. But the book is phenomenal. It is. It is. It absolutely. And there's just so much that Orson Scott Card puts in there about leadership and about followership. And from my perspective, I love giving it out to people. I've given it out to people as a leadership book before. So yeah, there's one point in the book where Ender Wigan, the main character, is basically ordered by Bonzo to uh, stop using his lap desk, right? And his lap desk, of course, is like a tablet. Yeah. It's how he does all of his homework. And Ender's like, what do you mean I can't? I can't use my lap desk. I can't do my homework now. And he talks about it with an upperclassman and the upperclassman's like, Ender, commanders only have the authority that you give them. And I read that line and I was like, oh my gosh. And of course I'm sitting as a commander, right? And I was like, that's totally true. Oh, so right? good. So good. It's, it's completely true. Commanders only have the authority that you give them. I have absolute power, right? The difference, I think that what you were getting at in terms of you know, you can have the education, you have the character, you can have the credibility, right? You can exercise the authority. You can exercise the power. Yeah. But leadership is not simply the exercise of authority and power. Right. Command is not necessarily, command is leadership. It's not just the exercise, the simple use of authority and power, right? Leadership is so much more than that. It's so much more dynamic. And like you said, people have been writing about it for years, right? There's nuance. It's an art. It's not something that is developed and achieved. It's not a perfected. It's not reached. It's something sought after because it's so situationally and contextually based. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. You know, Chef, we've been talking in a lot of generalities, really great generalities, but wondering here if we can get some examples that help us to really put this into that context that you're talking about. Where have you seen the failure or success of commanders as a result of their leadership philosophy, where they've done well, where they've done poorly? It could be your example, or, you know, you can keep it anonymous and, you know, protect the innocent, <laughs> but help us to see where the rubber actually meets the road. Where have you seen leadership succeed and fail? Oh, man. Um, so, you know, I went to Virginia Tech, right? Yep. And so I learned really quick at Virginia Tech in my junior year that uh, just trying to get people to pursue the things I wanted them to pursue, right? I really, really wanted to be the company that that was the best company in the core. And, and I thought by forcing compliance with a bunch of folks that that was going to make it happen, right? We were going to be the best company in the core. And, and I learned really quick. I was like, holy crap, I can't just make people do, do this, right? It's not going to magically happen. They had to want it. Mm -hmm. And enough people had to want it. That was the difference between I could force compliance so we could meet all the checkboxes. We could meet the requirement, right? But to go to that next level to be the best, 
it took a lot more. It took a desire. It took a passion. Yeah. And so, you know, I think about the Grateful Dead, right? They talk about three piece band when the fourth guy shows up, right? <laughs> that <laughs> you're a musician, right? So if yes. you've got a group of musicians and everybody is hitting right on together, everybody's in tune. And I think musically, I think scientifically, there's something there too, right? 100%. There's an amplifying effect there, right? Oh, yeah. And so you get a sound out of a three piece band that doesn't sound like it's just three pieces. You're like, there's something else there, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the fourth guy showing up. When you get a team that has a leader, where everybody is in sync, everybody is moving out in the same direction. Every not the band of in sync, right? No, 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 not in sync. No, no, no. That's in sync, in in sync, in sync synchronization. Sorry, we were talking music there for a second, so had to go there. Had to go there. You know, we're moving in one direction together. We're all bought in. We share the vision. We share the passion. We share the pathos. Even like we're all bought in, right? Yeah. We can accomplish more. And again, this is a chef's kind of liberal view of leadership. It's a very liberal view of relationships and that we can accomplish more when we work together. Oh, yeah. I do genuinely believe that. I feel like we are fallible human beings, right? We make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And because we make mistakes and we all have weaknesses, we need to be able to work together. We have to be able to work together as a team and use the strengths of one to overcome the weaknesses of another. And by working together, we can accomplish a whole lot more. And a leader's job is to get that buy-in, to understand where somebody's coming from, to help them grow, to develop them, to educate them, to encourage them, to build them up and move them out in a direction that may be uncomfortable, right? Leadership isn't just in taking care of people and meeting their desires, right? It's not being grandpa and being grandma, right? Yeah. It's growing them. That's difficult. That's challenging. No, it's more like being a parent than being a grandparent. Absolutely. It's the parental role, not the grandparent role. Yeah. <laughs> no offense to any grandparents out there. Not that, you know, right, right, not that yeah. there's going to be we a whole lot of them listening to this podcast, but if there are, no offense. <laughs> there might be. Might be. No, absolutely. It's about taking care of people and growing them, developing them, right? Like helping them reach their potentials, helping them move in that direction. So, Chef, this is so good. I could just talk on this, listen to you talk on this all day. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time. You're a busy <laughs> man. You are a commander. You're, in, in fact, you're sitting in your office right, right now, re recording this right now. <laughs> uh, the radio hasn't gone off. You haven't gotten any phone calls on the red phone yet. So I think we're okay, but no, it's, it's good. But we do want to be respectful of your time. Any final takeaways before uh, we wrap up here? What do you want people to know? Like, what is the thing that they need to know about being a commander and a leader of airmen? I think being a commander, I am filling a seat. I am filling an office. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that folks make when they take over this position and they take over this office is confusing their role with themselves. Yeah. And one of the things that I, you know, has greatly changed with my perspective as a commander over the last couple of years is the importance of identity and the importance of a measuring success. So my role as a commander, right? I could very easily, it is 100% dependent upon my people. Yeah. My success in the role as a commander, okay? As I'm filling this role and this job as a commander, my success depends on my people. And there's no doubt about that in my mind. I can try to micromanage it, I can try to control it, I can try to force certain results, right? But the reality is in the end, it's dependent upon those people and me telling people exactly what to do or doing it for them or micromanaging the hell out of them, I could do that. And I could get the short-term results and that might look good on my record, right? Yeah. But as a leader, that's not solving the long-term challenge. That's not reaching a vision. That's not working the squadron towards something that I need to reach for the long-term. And so I can't let desires for tactical goals or tactical things overshadow the long-term vision of where the squadron needs to go because of my short-term condition, right? Yeah. I shouldn't confuse either my success 
as an individual or my value as an individual with my success in this role and in this capacity, right? So I think it's really easy for us to be able to find our personal value in what we do as a job, right? Yep. It is my job, my role, my capacity as a leader. And it's really easy to start confusing my value as a person is my leadership role. And when we start to do that, right, my value is then threatened when my leadership is threatened. Yeah. If I do that now, I'm going to potentially make decisions out of fear because I feel my identity and I feel my value as an individual is being threatened. And I think that puts people in a really awkward position. It can threaten confidence, right? The reality is, is that I love the people that work for me. I love them all. They're great. They're passionate. I can accomplish a whole lot more if they own it. Yep. We can accomplish a whole lot more if they own it. Malcolm Gladwell put it this way in Outliers. The three things, they need autonomy, complexity, and connection with effort and reward. And that most people would agree are the three things that the three qualities that work needs to have in order for it to be satisfying. Right. And people want to come into work. They want to be satisfied when they go home. Yep. And I need to give them that. I need to give them the autonomy. I need to give them complexity and I need to give them a connection between that effort and reward. And, and as a commander, a lot of what we do is set the tone through our leadership philosophy. We set the environment and the climate of our particular unit of the organization that we're leading and help them get to that point, right? So that's, we create the environment, we foster the environment, we give them that vision and we let them move out. And in the process of doing that, we have to understand that leadership is temporary. Our command is temporary. Our value as a person and my measure of my identity is not wrapped up in that position. Simon Sinek talked about the defense official in the styrofoam cup. Yep. I don't know if you've ever heard that story, right? So, yeah. you know, he comes to the conference one year and he gets the red carpet rolled out. He gets the whole waiting room with the ceramic mug and the whole bougie, you know, green room. Yeah. And then the next year he comes back, he's no longer in the position, right? He gets basically, yeah, the styrofoam cups are right over there, bro. <laughs> so that's Classic. that story from Simon Sinek. It's great, right? Like, because it's a great reminder of people aren't honoring me. Yep. They're not honoring me. They're honoring the position. Yep. The office. I need to honor that office by my character, my conduct, my leadership philosophy. I need to honor that office as much as they do. Yeah. And if I look at it in that light, my value is not the office. The office is something that I am serving. And so making sure that I keep things in perspective in that way, it's challenging. It's not easy, but it's important to make sure that we shape it in that way. Oh, Chef, it's so good to hear you share your thoughts, your perspective. Again, we could just do this for hours. We won't. We could. But we could. <laughs> so let's put a pause on it there. I'm sure there will be an opportunity for you to come back another time and be a three-peat guest. I love it, bro. And beyond, because you know, there's so much more that we could pull on there. But in the meantime, you've been a previous guest. I encourage people to go and check out that episode. Uh, that's number 97 uh, to learn about the civil engineering career field and hear more of your philosophy there. The best career field in the Air Force. Exactly right. <laughs> 100%. At the time you offered your contact information for them to get in touch with you, the same holds true as it did before. Yep. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? So probably the best way is email T-S-C-H-E-F-F-L at V-T dot E-D-U. And then, of course, if you're active duty Air Force, you can look me up in the global. I think there's a couple of Scheffler or Timothys out there, but uh, look for me out of the 374th Civil Engineer Squadron. Uh, you can find me there. Yeah, go to Airbase. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. And we'll link that email address in the show notes too. And, you know, if they go back to your previous episode, they'll also hear you answer the question, what does it mean to be an officer? But we're not going to repeat that here because this is a discussion about command. I want to give you the opportunity to answer a similar question, but this time, what does it mean to be a commander? Oh, man. So the Joint Forces, JP10, talks about command as one of the seven joint functions of the Joint Forces, right? Command is the most important. It is the art, right? Yeah. So command is leadership within the military, right? That's how we frame it. But it's 
it's so much more. It's using the principles of joint forces. It's using the joint forces to be able to accomplish effects within a domain and within the confines of a unit, a military unit, to be able to accomplish those things. And so command is setting vision, is allowing for space for mission command, right? That idea that General Dempsey talks about to be able to ensure units can move out and accomplish a commander's intent yeah, without being told expressly what to do, how to do, but being able to accomplish those things as a unit. And so for commanders, its leadership is first and foremost our role in a military context and being able to to do the things that we expect the Department of Defense and the services to accomplish all around the world. Very good. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Scheffler. It has been a pleasure to have you back on the show. Love learning from your perspective, your experience, and looking forward to when we can have you back again to you know continue to pull on some of those ideas and make ourselves better officers, better leaders of airmen, and better able to achieve those effects as you've explained here. Anything else that you want to leave us with before we get out of here? No, Colin. Hey, I, I just thank you so much for what you read and you are doing and just helping folks educate. I've learned a lot through listening to your podcast about some of the other career fields in our Air Force. And the other tool has been great. I've been able to use your podcast and talking to airmen. You know, they've expressed ideas. Hey, I want to go OSI. Oh, hey, you know, there's this great podcast that you should go listen to that has some great tips and tricks about going OSI. Yeah. <laughs> so there's been several opportunities, great opportunities as a commander that I've been able to leverage your podcast. And I appreciate you guys creating the content that you're creating. And I uh, really do appreciate the opportunity to share my perspectives about leadership. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chef. It's been a pleasure and we'll see you next time. And that will do it for this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.